bit too quick there. I was going to try to make a joke and say if, ask if everybody saw this movie before, but anyway. All right, let me get mic'd up here so Gary can hear me. <laughs> Lights on. There we go. Okay. Great. So anyway, I'm sure many of us have seen this great movie, Adventures in Dog Sitting. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to share a little experience with that uh, just from a few weeks ago. So anyway, there's Andrew and Chloe. I don't know if you all know that they have... Oh, there's Andrew. I knew he was over there somewhere. And Chloe. Okay, she snuck in. They have this wonderful little dog... And this is a real thing now. It's not just them. Half Chihuahua, half German Shepherd. So you can look it up on the internet. They do exist. And um, so anyway, okay, now the, I guess I have to turn this thing on too. Okay, there we go. So there's Kona. And so they had asked, they were going on vacation. They asked me if I would watch their dog for him because I am one of only three people on this planet that this dog actually likes. So anyway... So I get stuck with, with watching Kona because he will attack anybody else. Now, not, it's not that bad, but, you know. Oh, and, and Houston helps out from a distance, too. <laughs> but it, you help out, at least. So anyway, so here's little Kona, half Chihuahua, half German Shepherd. And so the schedule for watching Kona is let him out at 7 in the morning so he can do his business and run around and bark in the backyard and bark up the trees and... And then come back inside and then, of course, make sure he's got fresh water and dog food. And then come back at the end of work, five-ish or so, let him out again. Make sure he's got fresh water. And, and then come back at 10 and let him out. And that was kind of the routine. And so there's this little dog sitting in the house while I was at work. And his owners were away on vacation. So from 7 to 1,700, 10 hours, that's a long time to just sit in the house by yourself. And there he is again at the end of the day. And so there's poor little Kona, you know, play with me. And I kind of thought about him and in, in kind of trying to make some spiritual application of this. And, and bear with me because this analogy kind of puts me in the place of God and Kona in the place of me. And I'm certainly nowhere near in the place of God. But just bear with me for that, I guess. Give me a little leeway. So here's Kona. And, and so... I would come in and I would interact with him certain times of the day, but then he was kind of on his own throughout the rest of the day. And he's a, he's a lively little fellow, and he wanted some attention. And he would play with anything, given the opportunity. That is a half-rotten pepper that the squirrels picked up off the neighbor's yard and dropped in. And so that was his favorite play toy for a little while. <laughs> but again, you know, I think of like application to us, you know, we, we want to interact. We want to have this relationship with God and we want to, you know, play with me and, and be part of my life and, and we want to kind of have that, that direct interaction. And sometimes we might be desperate. We'll, we'll, do, we'll make do with anything, you know, even the littlest little thing like a rotten pepper. Um, and so then trying to make this with some type of uh, spiritual application, I thought of the story of, of Saul and Samuel. And um, I'll just read this real quickly. Since we only sang two songs, I've got extra time, so thank you. Uh, so 1 Samuel 13 says, Saul was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned over Israel 42 years. Saul chose 3,000 men from Israel. 2,000 were with him at Michmash and in the hill country of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan in, at Gibeah in Benjamin. The rest of the men he spent back, sent back to their homes. Jonathan attacked the Philistine outpost at Geba, and the Philistines heard about it. Then Saul had the trumpet blown throughout the land and said, Let the Hebrews hear. So all Israel heard the news. Saul has attacked the Philistine outpost, and now Israel has become obnoxious to the Philistines. And the people were summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. The Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and soldiers as numerous as the sand of the seashore. They went up and camped at Michmash, east of Beth-Avon. 
when the Israelites saw that their situation was critical and that their army was hard-pressed, they hid in caves and thickets among the rocks and pits and cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul remained at Gilgal, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days in time the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal. And Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? Asked Samuel. Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. You've done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You've not kept the command of the Lord your God, the Lord your God gave, gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. And so I think of Kona sitting there waiting for me to show up and let him out. And, and I think in our, in our, I know in my own life I get impatient and I'm waiting and waiting, waiting for some appearance, for God to take some action, some part in my life. And I'm waiting and waiting and waiting and it doesn't seem to happen. And that's exactly what happened with Saul is he, he got tired of waiting. And then he, so he did what he was told not to do. And as soon as he finished it, then, then Samuel shows up and said, what have you done? And then Saul tries to put the blame on him. Well, you didn't show up. So I went ahead. I felt compelled to do what I thought was best. So anyway... Now, why would this little guy look like this? I came into the house one day, and there he was. He doesn't have green eyes, but you know that's the, the reflection. But those ears were drooping, and he just looked sad and guilty and because he had just eaten his bed. <laughs> so anyway, that's what dogs do when they get stuck in a house for 10 hours with nothing to do. And so then a few days later, he had to escalate things. So I came into the house, and he had eaten the chair. Um, so anyway... So that's what happens in our lives, I think, when, when we're waiting for God to like, have a, a, a presence in our life and we get impatient and then maybe we start misbehaving because we just we get impatient and we, we don't have that trust and that faith to just wait. So here he is. He likes his little chew toys. And he puts it down. He, well, for some people, he, he wants them to play with the chew toys. And this is another thing that I think sometimes we might do with God is look at the length of that chew toy and the distance between that chew toy and my hand. He's looking me in the eye and he's getting closer and closer. So he likes to work his way up the chew toy until he gets a little nibble on the hand. I know he does it on purpose. Um, and he's just testing. But, I mean, do we do that with God sometimes? You know, when God is, do we, we kind of bite the hand that feeds us, in a sense. And sometimes we, we can act out. And, of course, sometimes when we misbehave, God has to take matters in hand. And that's where we end up. So, anyway. So, that's, that's the solution with, with Kona right now. He's, he's in in uh, confinement when he's, his owners are away. But that's kind of, I think, how God deals with us sometimes, is if we just misbehave, sometimes he's just got to, just like he did with the, uh, the Israelites, sent them into captivity. Sometimes he's just got to put us in a cage for our own good um, so that we don't continue to damage, to cause harm and do damage. And then trying to kind of a bunch of thoughts, and my mind goes all over the place, but a few weeks ago, Houston talked about these, these psalms of lamentation. And he made the comment, and I, I challenged him on it, and he knows this is coming. But anyway, he, he knows that. But he said that all these, these, these laments, they were like, woe is me, life is terrible. But then the last two sentences were, but God is good. And then he mentioned the 88th psalm. So anyway, this is my Bible that I have at my bedside. So one night, I thought, well, I'm going to read the 88th Psalm. 
And so I did. And the last few verses, it says, I've been sick to death since my youth. I stand helpless and de desperate before your terrors. Your fierce anger has overwhelmed me. Your terrors have paralyzed me. They swirl around me like floodwaters all day long, and they engulfed me completely. You have taken away my companions and loved ones. Darkness is my closest friend. And that's the end of the page. So I turned the page, and it says Psalm 89. So there was no, that's the one exception, that there's not that, those couple verses of good news at the end of this lament. And so, you know, I just think, and, and just to be real, I mean, I, I live a lot of my life in that area where I'm saying darkness is my only friend, just to be honest, you know, just keeping it real. And I'm sure a lot of us deal with that, that thought where we don't have God. We're waiting for God to show up at 5 o'clock to let us out. Um, and, and maybe we misbehave because we get impatient. So I was driving down 741. This was actually last week. And that song, You're a Good, Good Father, came on the radio. And if you all know me, if you ever see me out driving around, if I'm in my car, I'm singing. Unless there's no song playing. If they're doing like the announcements or the news, I won't be singing the news. But So you'll see my mouth going. And, and so this song came on. And I've been thinking about this whole idea, this, these thoughts, and, and kind of how do I want to make uh, this little adventure with Kona um, applicable. And I literally heard that song and said to myself, I can't sing that song because I don't believe that right now. And, and then I thought, but you know what? It's a choice. I can choose to sing that song or not. And at that moment, I chose to sing that song. And this past week has been fine, you know. So, so really, I think it is a choice that we have to, when we doubt God's presence, God's working in our life, when we get impatient, we just have to choose to be faithful and to accept that he is a good father and we may not understand things. That is a uh, dashboard of a Sonic. My car is nowhere near that clean. But anyway, that's kind of what my dashboard looks like with a lot more dirt on it. Um, so anyway, there's that song, Good, Good Father. And boy, I can't even read that. But how, all, how, many familiar are, how many of you folks are familiar with this song? I see a few hands. So, so anyway, I'll read this. Okay, good, I've got a little time. So it starts out, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the, ten, the, I'm sorry, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night. And you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Oh, and I've seen many searching for answers far and wide. But I know we're all searching for answers only you provide. Because I know just because, I'm sorry, you know just what we need before we say a word. And then repeats the chorus, you're a good father. And then... Then it goes in, uh, it says, because you're perfect in all your ways. You are perfect in all your ways. You are perfect in all your ways to us. And that was that song that I was kind of questioning, can I sing this song right now? You know, saying, you are a good father. You are perfect in all your ways. And, and he is. And the, the point is, you know, just like Kona sitting there in the house waiting, probably thinking, I don't know what dogs think, but probably waiting for somebody to show up to let him out. Um, you know, we don't understand what's going on in our lives, but we just have to trust. And I think of, you know, Job said, when Job was questioning God, or God questioning Job, Job basically said, I'm unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. So he realized he really didn't have anything to say. And I just thought of this. That is a real Rubik's Cube with 17 sides or 17 blocks per side. And, you know, I think of a Rubik's Cube where you turn one, you turn one, you try to get one corner straightened out and it messes up the other five. Um, and yet somehow God has this Rubik's Cube that's got six plus billion squares on it. And he's turning everything so it's all going to work out. And we just, there's no way we can understand how whatever's happening in our life is going to affect the cube, you know, on the other side or whatever. But God does understand that. And so we have to trust that he will work it out. Um, 
And then Paul, you know, Paul prayed to God for relief from whatever this thing was that he was dealing with. And God said, you know, sufficient, my grace is sufficient to you and my power is made perfect in weakness. And the idea of the water ripples, you know, that you think about how whatever happens in your life, how it's going to impact all the people around you. And we just can't understand how things work, but God can. And he, he knows how it all fits together. So anyway, so I'm going to end with one of these laments of David. And this is Psalm 27. And this, this is the last two lines where he has the good news. And he says, but I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. So I think that's the message that I want to try to convey is that, um, you know, we don't know what's going on. We might un understand. We might get impatient. But God is always there. He's always trustworthy. And even though it may not seem like he's good, he is good. And it's all going to work out. So if anybody's wrestling with these kind of issues and needs any help to work them out or whatever, uh, or just you know, come forward now while we sing or talk with somebody after service.